Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our program this evening. Uh, before we start, uh, this is the first program that we've had since the passing of our dear friend and colleague, John McElhaney. And I'd like to ask all of you to stand, please, for a moment of silence. Thank you. It goes without saying he'll certainly be missed by everybody. A couple of announcements before we get going on our program. Uh, we have, we're, we're doing a series of exhibits down at the Burdett Mansion, as you probably know, and uh, we have one going, going on now called Back to School. It's kind of nice to come down and see it. We're going to try to be open a few more days besides the Tuesdays, and we're going to start off this Saturday uh, from 10 to 12, have kind of an open house. So if you're not doing anything, come on down and um, have a glass of lemonade and uh, enjoy, enjoy the uh, the exhibit. We're also looking for our, to try to uh, be open a little bit more often. We'd like some volunteers. Uh, if you have some extra time, you'd like to come down for a couple hours and just mind the store, we'd certainly appreciate it. You can let uh, Pat or myself know at the end of the program. And as you know, we have our ongoing restaurant raffle going on. So. If you haven't got a ticket yet, be sure to pick one up on your way out. Help support all our activities. Um, again, we also thank you for your continued support on paying your dues. That's how we get around to getting all these programs going. It's how we can support uh, all our activities. And um, a few people asked us when the next newsletter is coming out. It's a little bit late this year, but it'll be out, coming out in early November. So uh, look forward in your mail. And now, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sue Ellen Holland, who will conduct tonight's uh, first part of tonight's program. Sue Ellen. Thank you, Joe. Can everyone hear me? Even way up at the back? OK, thank you. <laughs> Good evening, and welcome to the Wuben Historical Society's presentation of Wuben Businesses from family business to the industrial age. I would like to recognize Ellen Hamilton for all of her help in organizing this program. Thank you very much, Ellen. <laughs> Ellen was our computer whiz. I would also like to thank the Wuben Public Library for allowing us to use so many of their photos in this program. Many of them are from the library's Johnson and Farino collections. Thank you also to the many people who brought photos to the Wuben Historical Society. To be honest, we have received so many photos from individuals that we probably have enough for a second program on family businesses. So look for that in the future. I would also like to thank the students and staff of the Wuben Public Media Center. I will start the program tonight with a quote from an 1898 article that appeared in the Wuben News entitled Contributors to Wuben's Industries. Quote, a city, like the proverbial cat, has more than one life. There are the educational life, the religious life, the social life, the political life, the municipal life, and the industrial life, each contributing its quota of strength to the general system. The industrial life of a community is its lifeblood. Without it, all other life becomes extinct. It is the only one in the entire list upon which all others depend." End quote. This is an aerial view of Wuben Center, taken in the late 1940s, early 1950s, and industry in Wuben is as old as Wuben itself. The earliest Wuben businesses were created out of necessity. The settlers in this area needed wood to build their houses, thus sawmills were built. This is an early photo of the Richardson Sawmill which was located on Mishawam Road on the banks of the Abijona River. It was built in 1843, and the site is currently the approximate location of the 99 restaurant. Horses were another necessity for the early settlers, so blacksmith shops were created. Here is a photo of the Bates blacksmith shop that was in Woburn. Guns were needed for hunting and protection. So gunsmiths were among the early businesses in Woburn. This is a photo of Marshall Tidd. 
He was born in North Woburn in 1820. His home and factory were on Ward Street. When just a boy, he made a gun out of a railroad spike. He never received any instruction in the art of gun making and made all of his own tools and machinery. During the Civil War, his telescope rifle was used by sharpshooters. It was known for its aim and its accuracy. The fine workmanship of his cane gun transformed a walking stick into a gun in seconds. He made rifles for many people of prominence, including General Winfield Scott. He was also known as a maker of pebble rolls and was widely known to the leather manufacturers of the world. Pebble rolls were used by the leather industry to make patterns on leather, and his were known as the best that could be produced. While few records exist of the earliest industries, we do know that among the first were the tanners. For many years, the prominent industry of Woburn was the leather industry. Our local sports teams are known as the tanners because of the number of tanneries that were once in Woburn. Benjamin and Francis Wyman were amongst the first settlers in Woburn. They were primarily farmers, providing for their families, but they did establish a leather tanning business as early as 1675. It was located on Wyman Street near Main Street. This is a photo of Benjamin Wyman's house in Woburn. It no longer exists. This is an early photo of the Francis Wyman house, which was built in Woburn in an area that is today known as Burlington. This house is still standing on Francis Wyman Road in Burlington. David Cummings came to Woburn in 1756 and built an early tannery in town on the west side of Woburn. The leather business would become almost hereditary in the Cummings family. David Cummings handed it down first to his son Ebenezer, then to his sons, Deacon John and Moses. Deacon John's son was the Honorable John Cummings, and Moses' sons were James Otis and Eustace Cummings. Warren and David Cummings, who still reside in Woburn, are descendants of this same family. Our guest tonight, William S. Cummings, is also related. This photo here, it's a sketch of Moses Cummings. Moses Cummings and his son, James Otis Cummings, lived in this house on the corner of Mountain Road and Winter Street. Moses Cummings was born in 1800 and started a business which manufactured and sold leather. His son James followed him into the family business and remained there until he retired in 1896. Moses passed away in 1840, James passed away in 1906 at the age of 78. His obituary stated that he was, quote, a member of the North Congregational Church and a man highly esteemed by all who enjoyed his acquaintance, end quote. And this house still stands at the corner of Mountain Road. This is Moses Cummings Tannery next to the Mill Pond in North Woburn. This tannery was an industrial school of sorts where the earliest parts of the lives of Woburn's most prosperous manufacturers were spent. Moses was the father of James Otis, John H., and Eustace Cummings, who was one of the leading leathermen of his day. Daughters of Moses married the successful tanners E.N. Blake, Louis Shaw, and Griffin Place. Others who learned the trade from Moses were John True and Jonathan Bowers Wynn. Today, this mill pond is the site of the Burlington Reservoir. The Honorable John Cummings was a prominent leather manufacturer. He was a charter member and a 17-year treasurer of MIT and was largely responsible for rescuing the school from financial embarrassment. He served as a state representative and as a state senator. He was a man of culture and a strong promoter of education for the young. He studied natural history and donated his large collection of birds, minerals, and fossils to the Woburn Public Library. He was married twice, but no children survived him. In this 1885 photo, the John Cummings Mansion was situated at 211 Bedford Road. John Cummings died in 1896 at the age of 76. He died at his home on the farm established by his grandfather, David Cummings, in 1755. At the time of his death, John Cummings' farm consisted of over 1,500 acres. Abijah Thompson was born in Woburn in 1793 and died in 1868. 
He was a direct descendant of James Thompson, one of the first settlers of Woburn. By 1827, he was able to purchase a small tract of land and built a tannery on the corner of Pleasant and Water Streets. This house on Pleasant Street is thought to have been built in the 1840s by Abijah Thompson, who owned the nearby tannery that's on today's Woburn Parkway. Today, this house is the location of Century 21 Real Estate. The carriage house in the picture no longer survives. In 1835, the growth of the industry caused Abijah Thompson to adopt steam power to keep up with demand. In 1836, his son-in-law, Stephen Dow, joined Abijah in partnership. For 30 years, they worked together, and the business increased rapidly. Abijah Thompson retired shortly before his death. Notice all of the hides drying in the foreground. The Thompson Tannery would become the Dow Tannery and would comprise all of the land now known as the Woburn Parkway between Pleasant and Sturgis Streets. Pleasant Street is to the rear in this photo. The tannery burned in 1893 in a spectacular blaze. The company then relocated to Cross Street. It is said that the smokestack was so large that part of it was buried rather than removed and is located beneath the parkway. Built in the early 1850s by Abijah Thompson, the wealthy tannery owner, this home was later lived in by his son and daughter-in-law, by his daughter, I'm sorry, his daughter and son-in-law, Stephen Dow, who took over the tannery operations after Abijah's death in 1868. This is known as the Dow Estate. A majestic front lawn ran all the way down to Main Street. A number of greenhouses were located on the property as Stephen Dow was very interested in horticulture and invested thousands of dollars in hothouses, conservatories, and the cultivation of flowers. The mansion burned in 1938, and today the old armory occupies the main street end, and houses on Myrtle Street and Caulfield Road and Court Street occupy the rest of the land. Another early Wuben Tanner was John Tidd, grandfather of William, who is shown here, and Charles Tidd, who built a tannery as early as 1760 in North Woburn. Like the Cummings family, later Tidd family members would also conduct the tanning businesses. In 1835, Moses Cummings, the grandson of David Cummings, would buy John Tidd's tannery. In the shop of Moses Cummings, nearly all the leather men of the city of the 1800s would learn the leather trade. William Tidd was a prosperous leather manufacturer who gave to the home for aged women the building that is now known as the Tidd Home. It was built by his grandfather and William purchased it from Jonathan Thompson. Charles Tidd was the brother of William, and like his brother, he received little education and worked with his father. Eventually, he started a small factory in which he finished tanned leather for outside people and was very successful. He was a member of the Board of Trustees of the Woburn Five Cent Savings Bank for several years. This is the Tidd home that is located on Elm Street. Elm Street was the main road through North Woburn before the current Main Street was constructed. This is a view of the house in 1890. It was originally built in 1809 by Lieutenant Jonathan Tidd. It has been used as both a home and a hotel. In 1888, the house was donated by William Tidd to the newly formed Home for Aged Women, and it has been occupied and owned by the same group ever since. Ebenezer Blake was a good example of a self-made man. He came to Woburn in 1839 and went to work for Moses Cummings. He was later connected to the firm of J.B. Wynn and Company as a partner. Later, with Charles Tidd, he formed the firm of Tidd and Blake and established the first tannery on the Woburn Branch Railroad. He was a director of the First National Bank of Woburn and was prominent in local affairs. The Tid and Blake Tannery was built in 1856. Tid and Blake remodeled a sash and blind mill at Han Pond Station. The building was destroyed by fire in 1876, and present day Fowl Street was laid out from Main Street to the railroad track through the land of Tid and Blake. Charles Choate came to Woburn in 1827 and formed one of the largest leather manufacturing firms in New England, known as Cummings and Choate. 
He took an active part in local interests of Woburn. He served in the State Senate, was a director of the Woburn Bank and the First National Bank of Woburn. And he gave medals to any children in the public schools of Woburn who were neither tardy nor absent during the school year. Here is an 1850s era sketch of the home of Charles Choate at 21 Warren Avenue. It was drawn by Marshall Tidd. Charles Choate died in 1883, and his wife Lydia continued to live in the home until 1904. The home was left to be used for hospital purposes. The Choate Memorial Hospital was organized in 1908, and the home was remodeled as a hospital opening in 1909. Wings were added in 1917, there were major expansions in the 1940s, 1952, and 1969. The Choate Hospital closed in 1989. Today, the building has been renovated by Cummings Properties, and most of it is used by New Horizons, a senior living facility. Some medical uses still continue at the rear of the building. Jonathan Bowers Wynn received his early education in Woburn and was a teacher in Wilmington and North Woburn. After learning the trade of Tanner and Currier, he joined the firm of John Cummings and Company. In 1841, he organized his own firm of J.B. Wynn and Company and did an extensive business. They were considered the best equipped and most prosperous leather firm in this country at one time. This is his son, Charles Bowers Wynn, who also followed him into the business. This is the Wynn Estate, the home of Jonathan Bowers Wynn and his son, Charles Bowers Wynn. They were the benefactors of the Woburn Public Library. The Wynn Estate was located on Pleasant Street, where the current Woburn Public Library stands today. The Woburn Public Library exists because of the generosity of the Wynns. When construction began on the Woburn Public Library, the Wynn Estate was not, not destroyed. Rather, it was moved a few yards north on Pleasant Street and relocated next to the Unitarian Church where it remained for many years, with the Woburn Five Cent Savings Bank building built beside it. James Skinner was a prominent Woburn businessman who opened the James Skinner and Company Tannery, located on Green Street. The factory tanned about 3,000 hides per week. He was the Woburn Board of Trade's first president and was one of the driving forces behind the establishment of the Woburn Cooperative Bank in 1887 whose goal was to open up business opportunities in the city and to attract the deposits of the city's Irish population, which was being underserved by other institutions. The bank remained in business well into the 20th century. The James Skinner Mansion is still located at 79 Montville Avenue across the street from the high school. In 1885, it was one of the largest homes in the city. By 1947, the house was converted into a music studio, and today the Skinner Mansion is a multi-unit apartment building. Warren P. Fox was born in Woburn in 1829 and went to work for his father, Warren Fox, at an early age. In turn, his sons, Everett P. and John W. Fox, would follow him into the family business. The Fox family owned a currying shop on Kilby Street and a tannery at the Woburn Highlands. This is the Fox Tannery at Woburn Highlands. The Fox family did much through its several generations to improve the industrial conditions of the community. Lewis Shaw learned the tanning trade with Deacon Cummings of the West Side. He was married to a daughter of Moses Cummings. Lewis Shaw owned a successful leather establishment known as Shaw and Taylor and accumulated a handsome fortune. His sons, Edward Lewis and Charles, would carry on the family business and the factory of E.L. Shaw and Company was once the most extensive in Woburn. The death of his father when he was a boy compelled John S. True to seek employment in order to help support his family. He learned the trade of Tanner and went to work for William Tidd. He would later become a partner in the firm of Skinner and True, one of the strongest leather concerns in New England. In 1885, 120 Montville Avenue was owned by John S. True, and the home was called Oak Knoll. It is located at the intersection of Montville Ave and Bow Street. Note the gardens on the side and the carriage house to the rear. 
While the gardens no longer exist, the house and the carriage house still exist today. Here is a photo of a group of tannery workers. The early tanning process took from 60 to 100 days to tan a hide. After the leather was tanned, it was usually given out in small lots to different finishers. They finished the leather and then took it to the surrounding towns and sold it to the shoemakers. The process was slow and the output was small. Years later, machinery would greatly increase the capacity with the daily output of the modern firms exceeding the annual output of the old time firms. One of the largest upper leather and finishing firms in the country was Beggs and Cobb. Its shop in Woburn employed about 150 people. The Winchester factory was exclusively used for finishing upper leather and was one of the largest in the world. The Winchester shop employed about 250 people. The Winchester factory was destroyed by fire in the late 1950s and the Parkview condominiums now occupy the site. William Beggs and Elisha Cobb were partners in the famous Beggs and Cobb's tannery. William Beggs lived in Woburn and Elisha Cobb resided in Malden. William Beggs was one of the original incorporators of the Choate Hospital. Following his death in 1916, his family made a substantial donation to the hospital, which allowed one of the front wings to be added to the original Choate House. According to his 1915 obituary, William Beggs was one of the best known leather manufacturers in the country. Another group of tannery workers. Leather dominated the Woburn industry for many years, and Woburn was known for a special class of upper leather which always belonged to Woburn. This quote is from an article in 1898. I find it to be quite ironic given what we know today. Quote, from the beginning of tanning in this city, it has been a well-known fact to the trade that the opportunities here presented for tanning purposes were unexcelled and that better results could be obtained here on account of the water properties than in any other known locality." End quote. The woven water used in the tanning process resulted in a high quality leather. While leather production is the first to come to mind when discussing Woburn's industries, numerous other businesses existed in Woburn through the years, many of which were related to the leather industry. These include businesses which produced shoe stock, glue, chemicals, band saws, and belt knives, which had a universal reputation for superior quality. One of the early belt knife factories was conducted by Charles Porter, for whom this photo of the Charles Porter Hose Company was named. Charles Porter's shop was located across the street from the current Walgreens location in the South End. Porter Street was named after him. The business would be renamed after his son-in-law, Edward S. Lyons, when he took over the operation. Edward Lyons owned several patents on special belt knives for the leather industry. Leather was needed by the shoe industry. This is the Simon Shoe Factory. It was located on Main Street opposite St. Charles Church. George A. Simons was a manufacturer and a dealer in heels, inner soles, and all kinds of shoe fittings. This is the Woburn Degreasing Company. Degreasing was needed to remove the fats and oils from the hides that were to be tanned. And this is a photo of a Woburn Degreasing truck. As you can see on the back, it's full of hides. The Woburn Chemical Works was started by Robert Eaton in 1853 to process and manufacture chemicals for the leather industry. In 1863, it was purchased by a group of investors who renamed it the Merrimack Chemical Company. Located in North Woburn, it produced dye stuffs and heavy chemicals used in the leather industry. It operated under various names, Monsanto, Merrimack, Stofa, until 1971. Another business that aided the leather industry was the Mass Gear and Tool Company. This is a photo of their building. And this is an interior view of the Mass Gear and Tool Company. In 1857, James Buell opened a machine shop 
in the Simon Shoe Building on Main Street. In 1874, he built a machine shop on Buell Place, and the large block on Main Street and Buell Place is known as the Buell Block. The Buell Block was used for residential and business purposes, and Masoda's Variety Store occupied this location on the right-hand side for many years. James Buell's son, James Frederick Buell, built automobiles known as Buell Steamers. They were manufactured in Woburn during the years 1897 to 1903. They were built at the rate of one per year and sold for five to six hundred dollars each. In this photo from 1903, Mr. Buell is at the wheel and beside him is his son, J. Frederick Buell. In the dark clothes in the back seat are the twins, Avis, who was later Mrs. Walter H. Wilcox, and Doris, Mrs. Frank Hitchcock, with their mother between them. The girl in the light clothes is Edith, who would become Mrs. Osborne Besenson. Mr. Buell's son-in-law was Walter Wilcox. He was president of the Tanners National Bank from 1917 to 1971. Walter was the youngest bank president in the country at the age of 29 or 30. The bank opened in October of 1917 at 325 Main Street in the Allen Block. Wilcox was also a co-founder of the Woburn Country Club in 1922. Mr. Wilcox started out in the insurance business, opening the Walter H. Wilcox Insurance Agency on his 19th birthday in 1906. His father, Walter L. Wilcox, had to hold the business license for a few years until Walter turned 21. This is an interior view of the Tanners National Bank as well as a Tanners National Bank $5 note. At the time, individual banks were allowed to print their own money. This is a photograph of the Tanners National Bank staff Christmas party and Walter uh, Wilcox is right in the center Many of the prominent citizens, especially the wealthy Tanners, served on the boards or helped to found a number of banks in Woburn. One of the earliest banks, Woburn Bank, was opened in September of 1853 with Abijah Thompson as its first president. It moved to several locations in Woburn Center over the years. It would later become Woburn National Bank, which was operated for many years by the Johnson family until it was sold to Citizens Bank. The Woburn Five Cent Savings Bank was the second bank to open in 1854 and moved to various locations around Woburn Center until it erected this building in 1887 on Pleasant Street at the corner of Federal Street. This building also housed the post office, the YMCA, Witcher's Drug Store, and SB Goddard Insurance. The upper two floors were removed during the Depression because they were too expensive to maintain. Today, it is the site of Sovereign Bank. Woburn Cooperative Bank was located in the Dow Block on Main Street at the corner of Church Avenue. During the Depression, they were a little more ambitious and removed the top three floors of this building. Once again, because it had become too expensive to maintain. Today, it is the site of several businesses, including the Woburn House of Pizza and Roma's Bakery. Woburn Bank and Trust Company, known today as Northern Bank and Trust Company, was started in 1960 by brothers Thomas and James Mon. The bank occupied the first floor of this building. The law and accounting offices of Mon and Mon was located on the second floor. Today, this building is occupied by Malvi's Florist. And this is a photograph of several members of the Mon family. Left to right, that's Thomas Mon his mother, Catherine Mon, and his brother, James Mon, who just passed away this past week. With all of the industry in Woburn drawing workers to the town, the downtown area became the place where everyone shopped. There were no malls at the time, so all of the shopping and dining had to be close by. This is Main Street looking north about 1900. 
This is Woburn Center with a view of the common. The photo appears to have been taken from the roof of the train station, which was located next to City Hall, where the present day courthouse is. A block of stores at the southern end of the center. On the far right was the location for many years of Masoda's Variety Store. To the left is the Malvies Florist Building today. This is another view of Woburn Center. This was called Woodbury's Corner and today is known as the Busy Bend. It was later the location of Murphy's Drug Store and Moore and Parker. Over the years, Woburn has had several newspapers. In this photo, you can see the offices of the Woburn Journal. The inset shows an employee of the newspaper hard at work in his office. The Woburn Journal printing office was located on Main Street. This is a photo of several of their workers. The Woburn Daily Times started in 1901 with its offices in the Dow Block. Its offices would later move to Montvale Avenue and in recent years to Arrow Drive. This is a photo of the Haggerty family. We have on the left Jim Haggerty, the current editor of the Woburn Daily Times Chronicle. James D. Haggerty Sr., the founder of the Woburn Times, and his son, James Haggerty Jr. This is the composing room of the Woburn Daily Times, with Mary Haggerty, the sister of the founder, James Haggerty Sr., on the left. And this is an interior view of the Woburn Daily Times with the printing press. This photo was taken about 1912. Flowers Bakery on Main Street was operated for many years by Philip Flowers. In this photo are Philip Sr., Frankie, Louie, and Philip Flowers in the back room of the bakery. Feeney's Ice Cream Shop was located in Woburn Center. And here's an interior photo of Feeney's ice cream shop. Here's a photo of Walnut Motors. Happy Nelson and John Shea were partners in Walnut Motors. When John Shea passed away, Happy Nelson continued the company. During the Depression, he asked his employees to make a decision, either take a cut in pay or we would have to lay off people. The employees chose to take a cut in pay so they could continue to work and at least be paid something. When the war started, he had to close since they needed all of the materials for cars and trucks to go toward the making of planes, tanks, etc. This photo shows Happy Nelson and his wife Hilda Anderson Nelson. Smith's store was located at the corner of Main Street and Salem Street. And the Lynch Cantillon Funeral Home on Main Street was founded in 1888 by Edward E. Lynch. When Edward died in 1938, his wife, Ned Nell Cantillon Lynch, became one of the first women to be licensed as a funeral director. Along with her brother, Edward Cantillon Sr., they operated the business with the assistance of Edward's sons. They were Edward Jr., known as Ned, Richard, known as Dick, and William, known as Gus. Ned purchased the business in 1950, and today it is co-owned by his son Edward III and his daughter Jean. Pictured in this photo from the 1920s are James Hennessy, Edward E. Lynch, Leo McDermott, Edward J. Cantillon, and Frank Ryan. Henry Service Station, as it appeared in 1938. It was located on the corner of Main and Church Streets, the owner was Henry Zanello, who passed away in 1942. In 1960, it became Lukey's Sunoco Station. Baca Lumber in the South End is the oldest family-owned business in Woburn. 
The Sun Electric Company was located on Main Street at the corner of Myrtle Street. Today is the site of the Armory Building. Uber Machine Company, makers of hide and leather working machinery. It was located in the south end on Main Street. There is a townhouse condominium development on that location today. This is an interior photo of the Bavuso cobbler shop in North Woburn. And the Middlesex Canal opened in 1803 and was the engineering marvel of its day. It was very important to the success of many Woburn businesses. Proprietors could now get their goods to market more easily. This is a photo of the Middlesex Canal with railroad tracks running right beside it. The railroad would eventually render the canal as obsolete. Railroad transportation was faster, so there was soon no use for the canals. This is a photo of the lock system on the Middlesex Canal. The canal operated for close to 50 years. It opened up the markets and the port of Boston to the raw materials and goods from northern Massachusetts and southern New Hampshire. In its day, the Middlesex Canal was a bustling transportation route. Not only did it bring goods to market, it also provided transportation for those seeking escape from the summer heat of the city of Boston. Horn Pond soon became a vacation destination. The Horn Pond House, shown in this photo, was a grand house in its day. It underwent many re renovations. It was on Canal Street, Arlington Road, but is today located on Lakeview Terrace off Inatu Road and Hudson Street. Originally built in 1810 as an inn hotel for guests traveling on the Middlesex Canal, it overlooked the canal with a majestic view of Horn Pond. Horn Pond from 1810 to the 1830s was a big recreation area and a popular spot for travelers, both those taking day trips and overnight travelers. With the decline of the canal and the railroad's arrival in 1835, business plummeted at the Horn Pond House. In 1888, Cy Chase, the engineer of the locomotive Arlington, ran into Hart's Express Car in this photo. This is the train, center, this train station that was located on Pleasant Street. This was actually the third train station built on this site, which is today occupied by the Woburn Courthouse. And this is an 1853. Woburn train. The C.E. Taylor Express was a Woburn to Boston railroad for goods and passengers. It was owned by Charles D. Taylor, who passed away in 1924. It was located where the Northern Bank and Trust Company and the Central Bank are today. Ice houses on, were located on Horn Pond. Ice was cut on Horn Pond as early as the 1820s. It became a commercial enterprise in the 1850s when Daniel Draper and Son constructed 10 ice houses on the southern end of Horn Pond. The winter harvest was 50,000 tons of ice. With the construction of a railroad line in the area, the ice business thrived and soon other ice businesses opened, including the Boston Ice Company and the Horn Pond Ice Company. The ice business came to the northern end of the pond as well with the construction of ice houses there in 1874. The ice businesses did very well until the 1930s when dust and impurities in the ice caused by the tanneries required the businesses to look to New Hampshire for cleaner ice. The last of the ice houses was torn down in 1941. From the Farino collection is a photo of workers at the Ice House on Sturgis Street. Another industry in Woburn was the greenhouse industry. At one time, Woburn was said to have many acres under glass. There were, and in some cases still are, greenhouses owned by Cummings, Richardson's, Johnson Roses, Mahoney's, McHugh's, Russell Farms, and Shannon Farms. 
This is a view of greenhouses in North Woburn with damage that was caused by Hurricane Carol in 1954. St. Anthony's Church can be seen in the rear on the right-hand side of the photo. By far, one of the most important contributors to the growth of Woburn's business and industry in recent years is the construction of Route 128 through Woburn. While plans had been underway since the 1930s for a highway around Boston, the Boston area, and parts of it from Lynn to the North Shore had been constructed, the stretch from Newton to Linfield was not completed until 1951. The grand opening was held on August 24, 1951, with a host of local and state officials on hand. Woburn had become a very convenient spot for new businesses. A pro-business agenda had been set by Mayor Murray, who realized that the decline of the tanning industry in Woburn had to be counteracted by attracting other types of business to Woburn. He and Mayor Shaughnessy are credited with attracting Sylvania, Salada Tea, Brody Trucks, Slumberland, and Boston Edison, amongst others, to Woburn. Hogan Tire, shown here, was built near one, Route 128. Founded in 1915, Hogan Tire came to Woburn in later years and is still located on Washington Street, right beside Route 128. Another business was the Atlantic Gelatin Plant, located on Hill Street, right alongside Route 93, just before the intersection with Route 128. Independent Tallow Company was located on Washington Street, not far from Route 128. The building was bought and renovated by Cummings Properties a few years ago. This is what it looks like today. In 1951, Mayor Murray announced that Sylvania Electric, a nationally known manufacturer of electronic components, would be coming to Woburn with plans to build a 100,000 square foot facility. Here is an excavation of the site on a portion of the old Bowser farm. The Sylvania Electric Plant, which employed 600 people, was located on Sylvan Road in North Woburn, directly beside Route 128. Here is a view of the Sylvania site as it looks today. The building is now part of Trade Center 128 Park, owned and operated by Cummings Properties. The former Sylvania building is to the right of the Middlesex Superior Courthouse in this photo. This is an entrance to Trade Center 128, owned today by Cummings Properties. And tonight we will conclude with a conversation between Kathy Lucero and Bill Cummings, the owner of Cummings Properties. In researching this program, I found it interesting that one of the first businesses in Woburn was started by David Cummings in the 1700s. And the last business that we'll cover tonight is also owned by a Cummings family member. While not a direct descendant of David, I am told that there is a distant relationship. Bill Cummings grew up in Medford, Mass., graduated from Tufts University, and became the largest business owner in Woburn. I would now like to introduce a fellow Jumbo and our guest for this evening, Bill Cummings. Great. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kathy Lucero, and this is William S. Cummings, Bill Cummings. And welcome to the Woburn Historical Society October meeting. It's a pleasure to have you here tonight. Before I start, though, I wanted to um, thank Paul Meany. And um, Paul Meany uh, is the uh, president, I believe, of the Woburn Business Association. And um, he gave me some information that I thought was quite interesting uh, in researching uh, what to ask Bill and to talk about, obviously, his wonderful development since he first came to Woburn in 1966. And Woburn has um, over 3,300 businesses that are here in Woburn. And those 3,300 businesses generate approximately $113 million in tax revenue for the city. And there are over 400,000 cars that come through Woburn every day at that cross of, that we talked about, the Cloverleaf, 128 and 93. And so much has happened since that developed in the early 1960s. And uh, Woburn has developed into a different industry, as you can see from the tanneries that we've talked about. And if anyone has seen the film that John McElhenney and Brian and I did, 
right through the farming industry, which we did just recently in June, which has a lot to do with the play because a lot of these farms are on East Woburn, and we'll talk about that today, tonight actually with Bill. The um, other piece of it that I wanted to talk about is how Woburn has changed, Bill. And it has changed, hasn't it? You are from Medford, raised in Medford, and um, your dad was a painter? He was a house painter in Medford and did you, a lot of work up this way. Are you born in Medford, or is your dad born in Medford, or did you um, raise from somewhere else originally? I was actually born in Somerville Hospital and, you were. and lived and grew up in Medford, however, went to right. elementary Medford high school, school, Medford High School, and then, as Sue Ellen mentioned, stayed there to, to go to Tufts. Tufts. And another um, wonderful uh, graduate of, uh, you graduated in 1954 from Medford High School? Medford High in 54, yes. And then in 1960, I think, Mayor <coughs> Michael Bloomberg. Michael Bloomberg was a couple years behind me. Behind you, yeah, he was. Two um, very successful businessmen that came out of Medford. We were very fortunate, um, you know, when I did the farming film, one of the interesting pieces, you know, a lot of people think of development and construction, and um, they have a negative, you know, uh, memory of it, or they have a positive, depending on what your, I guess, your position is. When I did the farming film, I really learned directly from the farmers, like David Lundquist, who I know, a wonderful guy in three generations, worked for the Cummings property now. You know, and the Andersons and the Johnsons and the Carlsons, all the Swedish population that was up and down Washington Street in Independent Tallow and Button Inn. And they told me a very interesting point. David brought a very interesting point to me, and that is the farms went away because the land became more valuable than the farm. That's one reason. But the other one was the next generation after World War II really didn't want to work on the farm anymore. You know, Sylvania came in, the Atlantic Gelatin was here. They didn't have to do that kind of dirty, hard work. The, the big Seven emphasis things. there, Kathy, is on the word work. work yes, All right. of the people That's you mentioned right. worked hard. Worked very it was, hard. It was very, very hard sustaining right. their businesses. And it has changed so dramatically. And I just wanted to back up um, the way you started yourself. I know that um, when you got out of Tufts, you went to work not for Old Medford Foods at first, but for Vicks. My very first job out of Tufts was selling Vicks Vapor Rub, and, and I had uh, I had some terrific experience traveling all over the country. My from June when I graduated of May until the first time I got home to my parents' home or stayed any like any place I called home was Christmas time, and it was a hotel every single night. Really. From from May till through December practically. But it was a terrific experience. And you went from selling Vicks to doing fish sticks. To another smelly product. <laughs> I worked. I worked for Gorton's up in Gloucester. Gorton's, right. Most of most all of us know Gorton's, and and Gloucester at the time had a, a reputation in many ways like Woburn. You knew it when you were near it. Um, smell. But, but, the smell. Uh, no. The Gloucester smell was very different from the Woburn smell, I think. And, and at that time, Woburn still had its share, and, and part of what we did was to acquire some of the properties in Woburn, which just weren't economically feasible any longer to... Right. To but you didn't, you, you came to Woburn um, in 1966 on Henshaw Street. I think that was the first building that you leased when you brought Old Medford Foods, because you bought that from a gentleman that had had the business for, what, 50 years? I and, did. Right. And um, how did you go from the food industry into construction and development? The property that we bought on Henshaw Street, which is down behind Atlantic Gelvin, between there and Washington Street, was the former Woburn Cabinet and Lumber Company. Some of you will remember the Ingraham family, or some might even remember Woburn Cabinet. But I, I purchased that site to move a business from Medford, which was down on Fulton Street in Medford. And I had the opportunity, one of the first people I bumped into after I walked in the auditorium tonight, was one of the earliest customers of old Medford Foods before we moved to Woburn. And it's Frank Nett, who's right up oh, wow. there, right, sitting right in front of my wife, Joyce. But Frank Nett at Donut Kitchen. Oh, the Donut Kitchen. The Donut right. Kitchen. Was, was a very early customer of Old Medford Foods and buying our fruit punch and lemonade. And before it was made in Woburn, though, and eventually 
perhaps because of his influence, I don't know. <laughs> we became familiar with Woburn more than I otherwise really? would have been and purchased the property on Henshaw Street. Right. That was for either 49 or $48,000 was the purchase price of the property. It's an acre of land there and a, at that time a 40,000 square foot building. And things have changed, haven't they? They have indeed. Yeah. Now, in 1969, you had, is that when you developed uh, Cummings uh, property did not come about till when? Cummings Park came about about that time sometime. 1969, Cummings Park, yeah, which is on Washington Street, which most people would when they yes. think of Cummings Park. Yeah. And how many uh, acres uh, did you have over there? Was it uh, like a half a mile of property that was there at that time? No, it was had? a good bit more a good bit more modest than that, but the first thing we purchased after Henshaw Street was the Anderson property, which was 10 acres, 20, I'm sorry, 20 acres. Mm -hmm. um, Ken and Esther Anderson and their son Richie. Uh, and Richie came to work and was at Cummings Properties for a long time after that. Later, we were blessed to have Dave Lundquist join our staff and subsequently his son at one point, now his grandson, and makes me certainly feel pretty old. But that that's that's uh, it, that much time has passed. Right. I know that he was so worried that when we were talking. He said that from being going from being your own boss to working for someone else, he didn't think he could make that adjustment. But he, I guess he did it because he lasted like 25 years. He, he certainly did make the adjustment, and he but had you got really, a great worker with him. Oh yes, he had three careers. First, he had his career in the growing, growing uh, in his greenhouses right. for a long time. Mm -hmm. Then he worked a long time with us, and. For the last 20 years, I guess it's been that long, uh, been in the apple business the apple up in Maine very Maine. successfully. So right. things, Absolutely. we all go through our own little Metamorphic. life changes, don't Absolutely. we? Absolutely. When you um, started um, out, Bill, how did, how did you really get interested in development, though? I mean, you really did change careers there. It was a, did you find that um, your growth was there? I mean, you really, you're a self-made businessman, and you went from you know, acquiring wealth and becoming um, a big wheel in the business world. And now, obviously, you're very different from what I've researched and talked to you about. A lot of philanthropic work is where your life is now with you and your wife, Joyce. How did you make that drastic change? I mean, how did you go from doing, you know, selling the food, and, well, the fruit touch, to this? The to transition develop? was very much, very opportunistic. Bought the first piece of property on Henshaw Street. It was larger than we needed to operate that business, and we found ourselves leasing a couple of small portions of the property to to others. Then had the land to build some more. That seemed to be a, a good a good investment. So we purchased we didn't purchase we we built an additional 15,000 square feet, and leased that to two significant firms bought the land next door from the late John McDonald, uh, bought a couple of acres there, put one building on it, then another one, then put a third one in between the first two. And Did you sell old Medford Foods to buy the Lundquist and Anderson property originally? Did you actually sell that business to? Well, that came a little later. It came a little later. Yeah. Now, um, when you look at the properties that you have now in Woburn, how many buildings do you have in Woburn now? I don't know how many buildings there are. There's um, this there's several several million square feet. Mm -hmm. Those buildings employ all together our Woburn properties employ 12, 12,500 employees. Wow. So a lot of jobs there certainly. Right. Uh, Cummings Properties itself, the organization, the total organization, and by with that I'm including Beacon Grill, for instance, I'm including the Horizons, mm -hmm. which is is part of part Cummings. Of the foundation. The Cummings organization, right. but there's a few more than 600 people there. And I think the biggest thing that we do in Woburn, uh, and more importantly, I think, even than pay taxes, and there's five million something thousand dollars in taxes, but the biggest thing we do is is to provide jobs. Right. There's a lot of people. Uh, the company has never had a layoff in, in 45 years now. There's never been a time when anyone was laid off for lack of work. The, the company is one that is, has been very stable in the community, certainly, and it benefited so much from being in Woburn. We had a, a general superintendent, some of you will know, the Venezia family in town. Uh, Bob Venezia was our 
was a master electrician who became our general superintendent in the field. And he was with us for almost 30 years. And he retired to, to, to start another business. He wanted to start a business with his sons and didn't need the corporate life anymore. But he was a graduate of Woburn High School. He was succeeded by uh, another, Greg Ahern, who many of you probably know, Greg and his wife, Chris, another case, a graduate of Woburn High School. And just such a, you know, a fortunate circumstance right. for us. Absolutely. Have, have and the Jamie McEwen was 34 years old, I believe, when he went to work for you, didn't he? And he was probably 29 at the time wow. and worked with us till he passed away at 41. But you always went after young, because I, I think I read that, um, was it at Vicks? Um, you were a young man at Vicks, and uh, you wanted a promotion, and they thought you were too young. That, that was my down. Made. That was what my downfall. <laughs> but you always have, since then, have really kind of looked, and uh, age is not a factor when you go and work within your own company. You seem to put young people in. Um, Dennis Clark is a young man, a very sharp young man, Jamie was. So you always seem to give the opportunity. How many employees do you have yourself for Cummings Property? Cummings Properties has 350 or 360 staff. And now, Greg, Greg, by the way, runs runs the field, and that includes 240 or 50 people who report directly to his division. Right. Now, um, in 19, if we back up just a little bit, in 1986, you and Joyce, your wife Joyce, started the Cummings Foundation. Is that correct? started Cummings Foundation in, in 1986, yes. Yeah, and it has four subsidiaries to it. The New Horizons of Choke, um, which I think is 1990, and then maybe in 94 you did New Horizons at Marlboro, which mm -hmm. is in Beverly. And then you did the veterinary um, school at Tufts, your alma mater. How did you get involved in the veterinary and, and giving, um, I think, $50 million that you gave? We, we did commit that amount to, to the what's now the Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine. But that was a, a question of need. Was it? People sometimes have assumed that Joyce and I are great animal lovers, and we've always enjoyed pets, and we're not a family that's ever had more than one at a time. Do we have more than one at a time, Joyce? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think so. Cat and a mouse. Cat and a mouse. Cat okay. and a mouse. That's pretty good. <laughs> but yeah, it really is a question of a need. Mm -hmm. There's so much that the school does in addition to provide training for veterinarians who take care of family pets. There are veterinarians who work in all phases of the tremendous amount of research that's going on today. Any any company that does any kind of research with animals uh, has got to have a veterinarian to take care of those animals. Right. There's nothing, ha nothing casual right. about it. Absolutely. Pets are important. Yeah. Yeah. The other piece of uh, your foundation um, happened Really, when you had a life, you and Joyce both had a life-changing experience in 2009 when you went to Jerusalem. Why don't you explain what that fourth piece of your foundation is? This lady's really done her homework, hasn't she? <laughs> <laughs> I've never participated in this type of appearance before. As a matter of fact, I will tell you that this is, I think, the second time I've ever appeared before any group in Woburn that really? wasn't in our building. Really? I think it's the second time. And there were probably 10 times as many people here tonight as there were in that first appearance, which was uh, a good happy. many years ago. So I'm very delighted happy to be here. here. We're very yeah. happy to have you here. Tell, tell, tell the folks about that, because that's very important. We met, or I'm sorry, we didn't meet. We were in Israel two years ago and finished our the bulk of our trip there at a place called Yad Vashem, which anyone who's been in Jerusalem in the last 10 years has probably either been there or thought about going there. It's the Holocaust Museum in in Jerusalem. While we were there, we met and became had an opportunity to talk fairly extensively with a Holocaust survivor whose name was Eliezer Ayalon, and who had been he was a a, uh, a Polish Jew who had been kept in five different concentration camps during the war, and we were so impressed with Eli, as we call him with Ellie Ayalon that we asked him if he would come to Boston and speak to a few groups here. And he did, but in the process, uh, he also stayed with our home for a couple of nights and we got to know him very well. And we're so moved by 
his talk. And you have you have programs here that people are really moved by. Something and, touches you. Uh, and and they they leave here. I know just you know, thumping their breasts about what a nice job you do. Well, this this guy did such a wonderful job here that we just were so concerned that having having come all those thousands of miles and took him 40 hours probably to get here, he then had to return home two days later and spend an equal amount of time, and all he had was perhaps three hours of public appearance. And we decided we wanted to try to do something to create other places that would be of in interest to people with stories to tell about Holocaust. about the Holocaust, about genocide, and lots of places and about injustice education. But the program that you uh, founded at Tufts is uh, so that it's a program where students can learn and um, about, so that we never forget about the Holocaust, obviously in World War II, but the genocides still go on today. Probably more importantly, the genocides that, as you say, still go on today. And one thing we've been able to do is to facilitate 20 students going to Rwanda the last, the last two years. The stories that they come back with having gone and spending time at a particular village there is called the Agazo Shalom Youth Village, which is a residential school for children who are orphans of genocide. And these tough students have gone, <coughs> excuse me, and then returned and universally thinking of that as a life altering experience, just to, to be there with right. the students and seeing how much they accomplish. So you support the program and funding so that these students can get this uh, education and go on and, and pass it on and teach about, because right now you see so many things on the news sometimes where maybe in the Middle East they deny that the Holocaust ever happened, and so it's, it's very important. Um, you know, I've interviewed many World War II veterans, there are so and many you have to continue on these memories. Well, they, absolutely. Yeah. And they, and they, the, uh, the Shoah Foundation has done a masterful job of that in Southern California, University of Southern California. There's a gentleman named Stephen Smith who actually was employed originally by Steven Spielberg to collect memories of Holocaust survivors, video, video memories. And that is a whole group of people who do that kind of work and, and, and just they dedicate their lives to this and from an early age, he and his brother, his brother went to medical school and then gave up his medical practice to build the Genocide Museum and Memorial in Kigali, Rwanda. And, and Bill, just you, the whole think, life, just, just for that purpose. But you know, do you think that someone, uh, people who are as successful as you are financially, um, that can make a difference, do have a social responsibility to give back? I mean, do you, did you feel that Certainly, but is there pressure uh, yeah. on you to do that, or is that no, not, something not that a question you... of pressure any more than you or the other volunteers here, who might not find it so easy to make cash donations? How much, how many hours, so many people in this city put into volunteer activities in all sorts of different ways? Right. And this is, and you know, we all do something, and, and I, I think it's a question of reaching a point in our lives when we have the time that we're not trying to achieve more in a monetary way. And we realize there are more important things to do and still be interested in the other things, but there's some more important things that can happen, too. And following in that light, it's very true. It is very true. <laughs> following in that uh, light, uh, uh, in the vein of thought, the giving pledge is uh -huh. not... Is not <laughs> I will never be part of the giving pledge, <laughs> but the giving pledge is for wealthy individuals, a uh, foundation that Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and his wife Melinda Gates started. And you are the first person from Massachusetts, to, you and Joyce, to belong and join the Billionaire Club that gives away 60, at least 50 or 60 percent of your wealth. I know you've given away more than that. Um, can you explain to people what the Giving Pledge is and what it means to this country? I think the giving pledge is something that's very admirably conceived to make it feel good and make it to, to be not alone, but to, to, to join an organization of other people. And I've got to say, we are the littlest fish in the biggest pond. The 
of 70 people in that group, and we are absolutely, we are the, the littlest minnow in that, in that group. But it, it's been a very interesting experience. You enjoy experience. some, uh, is that what you're we saying? We together. You can't compete with George Lucas and Star Wars and all that, <laughs> no? <laughs> He's in that group. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun to, to, to meet people like Warren, get the Gateses on a first name basis, and, and uh, talk to him on the telephone, and, and participate in different activities from time to time. And certainly it was. How does that work, Bill? Do you, ha you, you, you have to reach a certain level of income? and then personal income and then you, you give away? How does that work? I think that the, the way it's phrased is people who, who either uh, have reached that level or would have if they hadn't given it away. And we certainly aren't involved in the, in the league anymore except that we've given it away. Given so it away. From, their, from their category, we're okay. And you're okay. <laughs> you pass. You pass. Yeah. You know, when you started out in business, um, somebody had to give you an opportunity mentor or what does it take for a young person now with someone who owns a business in this economy to be successful? Well, first of all, let me, before I answer the, the first question, let me say that I think that right now there's every bit as much of an opportunity, if not more, than there has ever been for people to start businesses and to make a difference and provide a product or a service that other people want. It's just altogether different businesses today. Uh, in answer to your question, I have a mentor. I had two mentors. They both came out of Gloucester. They were the president and the chairman of, of Gorton's of Gloucester. Um, Paul Jacobs was the president and the chairman who went on to become president of General Mills. Um, Bob Kinney just happened to take a personal interest in me and gave me opportunities to go out and do things from a sales point of view and open up new territories. And the first time I ever managed to get a straight trailer load of Gorton's Gordon's fish heading up to North Dakota, and you know, it was, was quite a thrill. And eventually, we had them going up every week up up through the, both Dakotas and and Idaho and Montana and the places that had never heard of Gordon's before. But it was because somebody said, "You know, go ahead and do it." And you commented on some of the people who have started off quite young at Cummings Properties, and. Here, and we've just been very, very fortunate to be able to, to find people who would give it that extra effort. And that's the, the, the biggest thing. The first of all, somebody shouldn't be in a business for him or herself unless they really want to work at it. I mean, that old, that old Lundquist work ethic that we talked about here before, the, all the greenhouse workers. You know, you, just to go out and say, well, I'm going to have my own business. I'm going to be the owner, and I'll tell everybody what to do. You all know that. That's not... That's, that's not going to make it. But are it, you a tough taskmaster? Uh, I don't think so. You don't think? So? <laughs> We've probably got uh, oh, how many how many generations of anybody here work at Cummings Properties as a high school kid? I don't know. We've got we've had about forty for the last twenty years, I guess, uh, every year, and we see them coming back and, and doing different things, and it, it's, it's it's quite interesting. They work with people like Arthur Colucci that many of you would know has been with us for ages and certainly worked with Dave and, and, and you know, just, well, just I know Sue so Ellen's husband, has been, George has worked with him for many years. Too. Well, George, is, George came with the, even before Jamie uh, and more and, and, and uh, we've actually, we have a chair for people who, a nice, nice captain's chair, even, nice like even nicer than these. We don't spare anything. No, we, <laughs> yeah, we don't spare anything. But That's, I think we, we have a 25-year chair. And, no, it's a 30-year chair, isn't it, Well, We have a 30-year chair, and George informed me when he got, uh, Sue Allen's husband, George Holland, when he earned his 30-year chair, he informed me that he really would like to have a rocking chair, and we agreed <laughs> that on his 40th anniversary, he would earn a rocking chair, and we would make that, the, the, the 30 year chair is named after our late treasurer, Doug Stevens. But when George earns the 40 year chair, we'll name that the Holland chair. So <laughs> it, it would be that. The other thing that, a that, uh, little conflict of interest thing wasn't mentioned here. All these glowing comments. The young lady over to my right over here is a, herself a 30 year tenant at Cummings Properties. Right. Cool. So that, yeah, one cool. of the one of the very first 
daycare centers that was privately financed, privately run, wasn't subsidized by anybody, and just is, 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 is prospering today. Joyce pointed out to Sue Ellen back in the corner a little while ago that our daughter Patricia, who's a psychologist in San Francisco now, has a, an intern in the hospital where she works who announced to Patty the other day that, oh, I know, I know, Wolverine. I used to go to little folks' daycare. It's Sue Ellen Holland. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, and, 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 and ask Patty if she knew the Beacon Grill. <laughs> Patty knew the Beacon Grill. <laughs> but, and, and immediately we talked to Sue Ellen and she knew Christopher Smith's name and his brother's name. So uh, the young lady's got a, a, quite a memory as well as a, a long a long duration as, as the Cummings property. Bill, uh, the Trade, Trade Center 128, is that your last project in Uber? It was probably our last major project that I'm going to undertake. And we're looking at a couple of smaller ones right now that other team members are doing. We've, we've done a couple of smaller buildings that I had nothing to do with, and that felt great. <laughs> hey, we're going to bore these people to death. No, are we, no, 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 they're no, listening. No. Aren't you listening? Yeah, we're listening. <laughs> you're listening. Um, where do you see the future of coming property? Retire and go travel I hope not. I hope not. We do a lot of traveling. Yeah. Uh, our our deal is that we'll take at least ten weeks a year away from the business, and we pretty much managed to do that. We've been to a lot of interesting places, and as I mentioned, this year will be Rwanda in, in January. We've, we've been we've been to lots and lots of interesting places, That's but uh, the the business is is run by lots of other people, and I have. I was impressed you answer your own telephone. Uh, we we'll always do that. Nobody's ever going to ask who's calling. Yeah, I was kind uh, of impressed with that. For anybody at the company, we just don't do that. We just just have a different way of doing it. We want live people to answer the phone and answer your own phone if you're there, and you can do it when it rings. So. Uh, just, I just want to say one thing. Uh, I noticed that at Tops you had another program for um, students to learn how to run a business, to teach them the, the finances, to teach them how to you know do a business plan. Uh, that's a very important piece. That you program at Tufts. How did that come about? Um, is, is that something that you contributed yourself and how did you set up that program? We created a chair in entrepreneurship. It was the basic thing we did. My biggest interest at the time was having Tufts offer programs in, in business law because it, it's, it's so much any business person can learn. Never mind college, just get a college, college textbook on business law and read it and learn it. There's, there's so much information to know what know what the rules are and understand, understand what you're expected to do from a legal point of view. That's that's so important in any business. And and I guess the other thing that if anybody's heard me talk about books, you'll know that I'm devoted to Strunk and White's and their book Elements of Style. Uh, just a ter terrific book about just what to think of when putting letters together in formal documents. Mm -hmm. That you've got to, you know, we've all got to learn to hopefully speak clearly and, and certainly to write clearly. Right. We write things down and write and learn There's to write. Technology age and everything's so tech. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But Don't you do that, tech? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do. I do operate my computer though, and I do my own email. And you but. answer the, your own phone. Um, Bill, I, I'm very happy that you were here today. It was wonderful. I don't know if you have any questions, but I'm sure Bill would be ha happy to answer a couple of questions. But um, I do uh, want to thank you because Wuhan has changed a lot from uh, 19, early 1960s to now. And I think um, you and Cummings have done a tremendous growth in Wuhan and uh, we've all benefited from it one way or the other. So thank you very thank much. Thank you. It's I been a real pleasure to be with you. Guys. Does anyone have a question for Bill? I mean, I'm sure he'll answer one. Anybody have anything? It's too late, he said, <laughs> past his bedtime. <laughs> Do the football game start, Monday night football? I don't know. Um, no one has a question? Are you all shy? Go ahead. Yes. Will Vic's vapor rub always be around? <laughs> <laughs> Will Vic's vapor rub always be around? It, it came during the, the great influenza epidemic, and it seems to be doing 
pretty well. You can find it in every drugstore still. That's right. I, I use it every day. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? No? It's been a lot of fun being with you folks. Thank you very Thank much you for very being much. here. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.